Um, now, you, you see me up here as a published author, and you might think, you might think, oh, well, you know, he's written all these books. He's always enjoyed reading and writing. Well, the truth of it is, is that when I was very, very young, I was, I was homeschooled my whole life, and when I was very, very young, and my mom was teaching me to read, I absolutely hated to read. In fact, I, I actually, I went up to my mom, and I said, I hate to read. I'm never going to use reading the rest of my life. <laughs> yes, you can see how that turned out. And fortunately for me, my mom didn't listen to me, and she kept teaching me how to read and how to write, but it didn't make any sense to me, because, you know, there were all these strange little black marks on the page, and it was, it was a code, and I didn't understand the code. And it seemed like torture to me that I had to sit down and try to figure these little black squiggles on the page out every single day. And I kept fighting my mom all the way up until one day when she, she took me to the public library where we were living, which was uh, very far north in Alaska. So it was very, very cold, and the mosquitoes there are about, the so they're about this big. And they chase you in big black swarms, and if they catch you, they suck all the blood out of your body and leave a withered corpse behind. <laughs> but it's a nice place. <laughs> so I was, uh, so, so, so we, she, my mom took me to the public library, and I was in the children's section. And as I was wandering around in the children's section, I found this series of very thin detective novels. And they had bright covers and interesting titles. So I pulled one off the shelf, and I checked it out. And it was the very first book I had ever checked out for myself. And when I started reading it, for, for whatever reason, it was as if a switch just got flipped in my head. And all of a sudden, instead of seeing the word for, for sunset, for example, I could actually see a sunset in my mind. And I could hear what the characters were saying. I could, I could smell the, the, the locations. And it, it was like magic. <coughs> and in fact, I, I believe that that, you know, that very thing, the ability of books and of writing to transport us to new places and to let us see into other people's minds, that really is the closest thing to true magic that we have in the world today. Uh, unfortunately, I don't remember exactly what that book was that got me into reading. I don't remember what it was, uh, that the name of it, or what it was about. Uh, but I do remember that it was about, uh, it was a detective story, and it involved tomato sauce being mistaken for blood, which seemed very, very exciting to me when I was five years old. Um, so after that moment, you know, I read everything I could get my hands on, and I read, and I read, and I read, and of course I started getting fantasy books in, and fell in love with fantasy, and read lots of fantasy. And eventually, I graduated from high school at 15. As I said, I was homeschooled. My sister and I were homeschooled. So that gave us the freedom to sort of, you know, go through the textbooks at our own pace. And, and we never took summer breaks either. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> we never took summer breaks either, which ended up giving, putting us several years ahead. So I graduated graduated at 15, and when I graduated, the, my first thought was, no more school. This is going to be awesome. <laughs> and it was awesome for about two weeks. <laughs> and then I got really, really, really bored. I got so bored that I went to the backyard of our house, because we lived in Montana, we lived in Montana, we had a big yard, I went into our yard, and I dug a hole. <laughs> and it was, the hole, it was a big hole, too. It was about two meters deep, and it was about a meter wide, mm, meter and a half wide. It was circular. So I dug a hole down, and then we had one of those really big satellite dishes that um, you, you used to see all over the place. There was, a, there was a big satellite dish that was abandoned on our property. And so I dragged it over to the hole, and I put it over the hole, and I made a roof for the hole. And then I took lots of bales of hay and straw, and I piled them on the satellite dish for insulation, 
and then I thatched it with uh, pieces of bark from dead trees. Uh, so I made quite a little house like that. And, and, now you, and you might be wondering how I got into the hole if I had the satellite dish on top of it. Well, I dug a tunnel into the hole. And then I built an entryway for the tunnel. And then I took a claw hammer and I started chopping down dead trees with a hammer. And I dragged them up in front of the hole and I planted them upright in front of the hole to form the framework for what was going to be a Viking style mead house. Mead hall. Now, when you start building giant holes and Viking style mead halls in your backyard, you are officially bored. And I realized that I had to find something else to do with myself aside from digging holes. As, as much as I enjoyed it, I needed to do something else. And the thing is, is I didn't have to do anything. I wasn't in school, uh, I didn't have a job, I didn't have a car, and the nearest town was over a half an hour's drive away. So, you know, I couldn't just walk to the nearest bookstore or movie theater. So, I didn't have to do anything. And I think that everyone ought to have that experience where, you know, you have no job, you're not in school, and no one's, t no one's telling you what you have to do. And whatever it is you choose to do in that time, you know, whether it's digging big holes, or uh, playing video games, or making video games, or working with mechanics, or reading, whatever it is, that's probably what you should pursue as a profession. And in my case, that was writing. And since I loved reading fantasy, I decided that I wanted to write the sort of story I enjoyed reading myself. And, and I wanted to pay tribute to all the great fantasy books I, I, I really loved. So I knew I wanted to have a, you know, a wise old mentor, and an evil villain, and a young hero, and a magic sword, and a, and a dragon. A dragon with sparkling scales. And so I, I spent about a month thinking about the story for Aragon, and the rest of the series as well. And I actually plotted out the whole series before I began Aragon. And when I started writing Aragon, it was, it was awesome. You know, have you ever watched a movie where you think they should have done something differently in the movie? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. yeah, okay, so when you write your own book, it's like watching a movie where every single thing in the movie is exactly the way you want it to be. So, that's what it was like writing Aragon. It was so much fun. And I just, I raced through the first draft of the book, and when I finished, I sat down and I read it through for the first time. And I was really excited. You know, I got to read my own book for the first time. It was horrible. It was awful. The story was there, but the writing itself needed a lot of help. So I said, okay, I'm going to try to fix it. And I spent an entire year and I rewrote the book from start to finish. I kept the story, but I fleshed out the characters and the world and stuff. Um, in fact, just to give you an idea of how bad that first draft was, in the very first draft of Aragon, Aragon wasn't named Aragon. Aragon was named Kevin. <laughs> Now, if, if, if any of you are named Kevin, you know, it's a great name. I like the name. But I don't think the series would have been quite so popular if it had been about the adventures of the great dragon rider, Kevin. Um, so, yes, I had a lot of fun reworking the book. Uh, one of the things I did on the second draft was I, I put the character of Angela the Herbalist into the book. And as some of you may already know, I actually based her on my sister, Angela. And uh, fortunately for me, my sister has a very good sense of humor, or else I wouldn't be standing here right now. Um, and eventually, I, when I was ple pleased with the book, I gave it to my parents, and fortunately for me, they liked the manuscript, and so we decided that together we were going to self-publish the book and see what would happen with it, see if it would be a success. And that's exactly what we did. And it was a big risk for us because it was, a, it was a big financial risk and it took a lot of time and we weren't sure if it was going to work out, but we thought, you know, we have to try. And so to get attention for the book, 
I traveled all across the western half of the, of the United States doing presentations somewhat like this, but I did them while dressed in a medieval costume. And it was, it was black, knee-high, lace-up leather boots, billowy black pantaloons, a big black pirate belt, a billowy red swordsman shirt, and a black beret to top it off. Wow. Now you have to keep in mind that the very first presentation I did was in our local high school, public school. I had never been in a public school before, okay? So I was 17 years old, I was the same age as all those students, and they arranged for this, that they, they funneled the entire school through the library in three batches. So I did three one-hour-long presentations back-to-back, -back, dressed in medieval costume. And when I walked into the library for the first time, dressed like that, from the back of the room, what I heard one of the guys go, Hello, Romeo! <laughs> As you can tell, I don't wear that costume anymore. <laughs> but I had a fun time traveling around the countryside with the book and meeting a lot of people, interesting people and interesting readers. And of course, eventually, um, Random House did um, pick up, you know, they, they discovered the book and they picked up the book and published it in the United States. And then, of course, they published it. It got published all around the world, something that I never expected. Uh, you know, I thought that maybe my, at the most, my parents would read the book, and if I was really, really lucky, my sister would read the book. But I never, never imagined that there would be readers of the series all around the world. Uh, so that was, that was an amazing experience. Um, and, and with each of the books since, you know, there have been some fun things that have happened. Uh, for example, right before I went on tour for my second book, uh, Eldest, I was at home, I was preparing for the book tour. Well, actually, I was supposed to be preparing for the book tour. I was actually playing video games. Uh, I was playing a, a computer game called Jedi Knight, Jedi Knight Academy 2, uh, which was actually lots of fun, very, very good. And so I was playing online, and I was dueling, dueling people from all around the world uh, with lightsabers. So, you know, we're fighting with lightsabers and killing each other and having lots of fun. And someone, in the middle of the game, someone logged into the game using the name Aragon. And I said to myself, oh, I've got to fight this guy. <laughs> and so I went over and I challenged him to a duel, and he accepted, and we faced off against each other. And the horrible thing is, he was better than me. And he beat me. And across the screen it said, you have been killed by Aragon. <laughs> I didn't need to see that. Um, and, then, and then for my third book, Brissinger, when I was on tour for it, I was in, um, I was in, the, it was in the United States city, uh, I was in Chicago, in the US, in Chicago, and I had a young woman come through the signing line and on her arm, she was, carrying, um, she was carrying a sugar glider. Now, I don't know if you know what a sugar glider is, but uh, it's a small animal, and it's kind of like a flying squirrel, but it's a marsupial, so it has a pouch in the front, and they have very large eyes, and they're very, 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 very cute. So I looked at the woman, and I said, well, that's a really interesting animal. Do you mind if I pet it? And she said, Oh, sure, go ahead. He loves strangers. <laughs> so I, I reached out and I started petting the sugar glider, and it looked up at me, and then it took its hands, because they have hands, kind of like a raccoon. It took its hands, and it wrapped its fingers around my finger. And then ever so delicately, it began to gnaw on my hand. <laughs> And so I was sitting there, and there was blood running down my arm. And I was looking at the woman and saying, Will you please stop your pet from trying to eat me? But I'm, I'm kind of glad that it happened, because uh, I'm now one of the few people in the world outside of Australia who can say that I have been gnawed on by a marsupial. 
So I figure that's kind of like a, a, an achievement in a video game, you know, gnawed on by a marsupial, 200 points. I'm kind of proud of that, although I hope I don't repeat that experience. Um, and, then, and then when I was finishing book four, when I was finishing Inheritance, uh, I was actually in New York City, working, working at Random House, the Random House U.S. headquarters, with my editor, and during the very last week of work on the book, and on the entire series, on that very last week of work, New York City got hit by both a hurricane and an earthquake. And my editor came to me and she said, she said, Christopher, I love you dearly, but you really, really have to finish this series before any more natural disasters occur. <laughs> so finish it I did, and I'm very proud of the book, and I'm very proud of the series.